Hello, and welcome again to The Goddess in Art. This series is dedicated to the power and creativity of the goddess. My name is Star Goody. My guest this evening is Starhawk, who is a peace activist and a leading spokesperson for the Goddess Spirituality woman, Movement. Also, she's the author of three books, Truth or Dare, The Spiral Dance, and Dreaming the Dark. And today is a special occasion because we're marking the 10-year um, anniversary of The Spiral Dance, and Harper and Row has just reissued it, and there is a new introduction, and there's a chapter-by-chapter -chapter commentary. So, Starhawk, thank you for coming here today. Thanks. It's great to be here. Well, the first obvious question is, um, why did you want to come out and mark these 10 years? You know, why did you want to do, you know, this, this edition of the book? And, and what's happened in the last 10 years? And are you surprised at things? <laughs> it's surprising to me that the book came out 10 years ago, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, there were a number of reasons why we decided to do a new edition. One is just that the whole feminist spirituality, goddess movement, has changed so much in the last 10 years. When the spiral dance was first written and put out, it was this very odd, tiny, fringy little thing that nobody had ever heard of, no one was interested in. And now there's just tremendous numbers of people who are involved one way or another in researching the goddess, in creative activities, in the arts, mm -hmm. in performance, in drama, in doing their own rituals, creating their own ritual circles. There's a covenant of Unitarian Universalist pagans within the I Unitarian Church. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we had a ritual to mark the emergence of the 10th anniversary edition in San Francisco with over a thousand people mm -hmm. there. And since it was 10 days after the earthquake, we thought that was quite amazing. Now you did a, um, a dance the first time it came out, That's too, right? That's right, yeah. That was the first time we did the ritual. We called it the spiral dance ritual. And uh, so we decided for the 10th anniversary. Actually, people have taken that ritual and done it. We've done it not every year, but roughly every other year for the last decade. And of course, that was for Halloween or the Great Witch's Holiday of, of Samhain. How, right. how, how is it different, like 10 years ago, that dance and, and the one that you just did last month? Well, you know, it was funny because I just discovered that I actually had a video of the first Oh, Spider really? Dance. <laughs> <laughs> and we were kind of watching it going, now this is really funny, you know. <laughs> Why did people want to do this ritual again? <laughs> The first one was this grand experiment at doing ritual on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. um, and it had quite a lot of performance elements to it. It had dance, it had theater, it had invocations, and it culminated in everybody dancing a spiral. And that was in some ways what we did. Um, we just did it yet again on mm. a larger scale. But that interface between ritual and performance is a very fascinating one mm. to work in. And I think 10 years ago, we thought people would be coming to the ritual who had never had any experience of ritual before, who would need to be kind of lulled into comfort by a performance and then maybe brought into a dance. Um, this time, we we expected people to come with a lot of experience behind them. Uh, we tried to create an atmosphere where even though there were so many people, it could also be very personal. Exactly. For us, this time of year is very important. It's the new year. Mm -hmm. It's the time when you remember your ancestors, when you celebrate your beloved dead, when they return and visit you. And so we have part of the ritual where we name people who've died this year. Um, and of where we especially touching in San Francisco too. Yeah, it, it's very meaningful in San Francisco because we really live with a lot of death there. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the city, I think, knows somebody who has had AIDS um, or who is at risk for AIDS. And then, of course, we did have the earthquake ten days before, and so it was very clear to all of us that, you know death is always there. It's always a reality. It's always a possibility. It's not something that we can control. Um, and yet, it, at the same time, it is something very natural, something that is part of life. 
uh, something that, in a way, gives life depth and meaning. Exactly, and it, it you know, I mean, to take that view to encompass it all. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I was just struck, like in the last month, um, of course, your book came out. Your this this reissuing of the Spiral Dance, uh, Maria Gimbutas' long-awaited book, right. The Language of the Goddess. You Which know, is un so wonderful. Yes, unearthing the hidden you know, symbols of Western civilization. And that book's so edifying. And then um, Eleanor Gaydon's book mm -hmm. on the once and future goddess. And of course, the Budapest book on um, the grandmother of time. So here we have like people like Maria really showing us that um, you know the goddess, that this witchcraft religion, that it's really the oldest religion in Western civilization. And um, Mer and um, Eleanor's book showing us this explosion of of really an international goddess art movement. And your two books, you and Z, you know about this interest in in the craft too. So it's. You know, there's really a lot going on. But one thing I was wondering, I, I have this always this image in a certain way in the back of my mind in the 60s of um, Stokely Carmichael saying, well, you know, you'll never see the President of the United States standing on the White House saying, you know, black power and that whole symbol of the fist of, of you know, black power, raising the fist. And within a year or two, Richard Nixon stood on the steps of the White House and he raised his fist with all these black businessmen and said, mm -hmm black power, you know. Yeah. So do you wonder, I mean, is it's getting more popular of any kind of, you know, co-opting or like using the symbols or imagery in, in to denude it of its power? Or? Well, I think that's always a danger with any movement and with any symbol that has power. Um, somebody called me up went very upset saying she'd seen a line of dresses that were called, you know, goddess garments, which sounded nice, but that they had little price tags on it and one of them had uh, one of the chants that I wrote, which goes, she changes everything mm -hmm. she touches, mm -hmm. on the price tag. And I got very, <laughs> yeah, right. I called up and said, wait a minute, you know, this is not something that um, is there to sell something, regardless of how beautiful and wonderful it is. You know, this is yeah. like. Just grafting something on mm -hmm. the top without, with all the structure, you know, being the same. Because to me, if we really understand what the symbolism of the goddess means, it's very radical yeah. and it's very threatening to the way we live our lives because what the goddess really is is a you could say a metaphoric shorthand for saying hey this earth that we live on is alive mm -hmm. and all of us are part of it mm -hmm. all of it is interconnected um, when we talk about the four elements being sacred as we do mm -hmm. a lot in the goddess traditions you know we're saying air fire water and earth are sacred. What that really means is that these are the things that should determine our values, that should determine the value of everything else. And if we took that seriously, you know, if we took seriously that the air was sacred, it would mean anything that destroys the air cannot be done. You know, that's insane, mm -hmm. isn't it? Right. <laughs> you know, it? it would mean poisoning the water is really, you know, ins and it is insane. You know, what's really insane is that we just you know, we don't recognize this, that we go ahead, you know, throwing away our styrofoam cups and pouring our poisons into the water when um, it should be clear to anybody that poisoning your water supply is a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. for this touted age of reason, it's pretty crazy. You know, one thing I was thinking, too, is um, you as a political activist, and I mean, in some ways, you know, when you think of a traditional political activist, in some ways you don't fit that mode. I mean, I'm thinking of Berkeley in the 60s or whatever, of, you know, just kind of a traditional leftist. Uh -huh. But, but, you know, and partly because of how you incorporate, like, for example, mystery, the concept of mystery is really important to you in your life, in your work, and reshaping culture. And, and, you know, you see mystery as this force greater than us, you know, and that moves through us, and it's greater than human will, and yet we can call upon it to help us change things, and that there's this relationship between humans and the mystery and, and the dark and what we don't know. And, um, and yet you say that uh, mystery is really a tool to transform culture. <laughs> so I wanted you to address that, you know, to transform this culture that's just, you know, infected with violence and greed into uh, how would mystery could change that into a more life-affirming culture. Well, one of the things I think that's wrong with our culture is that we think we know the answers to a lot of things that we really don't know. Hmm. You know, we think we can define and quantify things that can't be quantified. Um, 
you know, in a way that really is insane. Yeah. <laughs> You know, for example, like we just had the, the freeways fall down, some of them in San Francisco, and people will say, well, what do you make of the earthquake? And you go, well, what I make of the earthquake is that, that this is what the earth does, you know, yeah. all up and down California. She has done this for millions of years quite dramatically. You know, the, the Sierra Mountains have risen up and eroded down and risen up again. Mm -hmm. You know, things change. The earth actually does not hold still alive, she's alive, she moves. Nature's right? dynamic. Yeah. Okay. What's yeah. insane is that we think that on this moving earth we can build double-decker freeways that won't fall down and that somehow or other we know all the factors and all the possibilities and all the calculations. Oh, everything's fine. Right. There's people always like, or that we we've can got build it under control. Nuclear power plants mm -hmm. on earthquake faults and, you know, and that these are safe and we can control it. We can't control it and we do better. We're more rational when we acknowledge what we really can't control, when we acknowledge that the earth is bigger than we are, mm -hmm. um, that we can live in balance, we can live in harmony with it, we can learn to do that, but we can't impose a kind of numerical order on something that has factors that go far beyond that. So I think mis mystery is a, a necessary corrective, you know, to our scientists, to um, our politicians and our political movements, because one of the things that always hampers political movements is people get stuck again saying, this is the answer, you know. And if you don't agree with my particular version of the answer, and exactly the way I phrase it, you are bad and wrong and, you know, out of... Really, to me, politics, um, there's a definition of magic that a woman named Dionne Fortune coined, I think, back mm -hmm. in the 20s, says magic is the art of changing consciousness at will. And I think that holds up very well also for political change. That when we're talking about the kinds of changes we need in our culture, we need vast changes in consciousness. And that can't be done by imposing it on people. Right, or thinking that mm -hmm. you know the solution. Because really, you know, when I saw that the image of the bridge you uh -huh. know, collapse like that, I thought the bridge that human arrogance built, you know, that it was, you know, it was to stand, or that, you know, we think, you know, that we can reason our way out of it, but actually by not putting reason in a perspective, it becomes very unreasonable, or the power of what we don't know, the power of mystery, and to say we know we need a change, but to, to let that come through for us, and, you know, like have our visions, and yet work through, mm -hmm. you know, letting that mystery take us someplace. As you said, I, I love this, at the end of Truth or Dare, I think you said, Mysteries have a bad attitude. <laughs> Mysteries cause trouble, you know. <laughs> Mystery's a bitch, you know. And it takes us someplace because, I mean, if you thought it was on your shoulders to solve everything, I mean, wouldn't your spine just... <laughs> yeah. And I think embracing mystery doesn't mean letting your mind go out the window. It doesn't mean denying reason. It means putting it in a perspective. And, again, in a way, changing your attitude from one of you know, we know it, we can control it, to an attitude of wonder yes. at the universe, wonder at the things which are the real mysteries, which are actually the most common things, the things that we all go through, like birth and growth and love and death and change. And, you know. Yes, or the sunlight today, which had uh -huh. this fantastic coppery golden quality to it. Um, and, you know, you, you write that uh, witchcraft isn't, you know, a religion of dogma and rules, but of poetry, uh -huh. you know, or that, um, <clears throat> and that's, again, that power of the imagination and, and images to, to transform us. And you had this phrase that was said, creation or something is the ultimate resistance. And again, that, that using spirituality to political action. Yeah, that effective political change comes through creation, through creativity, mm -hmm. through saying, mm -hmm. you know, we have to create and envision the world that we want to live in, and we have to enact it as much as we can in our own lives, and we have to understand that sometimes this is going to directly confront the world that is. Mm -hmm. It may cause trouble, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> it caused a little trouble in your time, Ace Turner. Well, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> In fact, I was Probably not as much as I should have caused. Oh, well. Caused. Well, you've got a uh -huh. span of time right, ahead of time. <laughs> because I was thinking, um, 
it was just about a year ago, actually, you mm -hmm. made uh, public headlines throughout the country, because I remember it was in the New York Times mm -hmm. even about um, sort of a little bit of a witch hunt of your own when uh, you're teaching at um, the Institute in uh, it's Culture and Creation Spirituality, right, yeah. and it's run by uh, Father Matthew, Matthew Fox. Fox, who's a Dominican priest, and uh, the Vatican wanted you fired because you yeah. were a witch. So. Yeah, they wanted Matthew Fox to sever his connection with me, and since their letter mentioned me by name, it was. <laughs> I felt a little like uh, Bilbo Baggins in Lord of the Rings, where Gandalf tells him that, you know, the Dark Lord is after him, and he goes, "But, but how did the name of Baggins come to the attention of the Dark Lord himself?" You know. <laughs> I saw Eleanor Gaiden, uh -huh. that I was up in San Francisco, she says, oh, the Pope's afraid of Starhawk. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a funny construct. It's really rather ridiculous, yeah. actually, when you, I mean, when you consider the immense power and wealth and just the sort of institutionalized power of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and the fact that the Catholic Church has been directly responsible for persecutions against the old religion mm -hmm. for four or five hundred years. Mm -hmm. You know, the things um, that were done by the Inquisition are not a matter of, you know, scholarly controversy. They're a matter of record. That's you right. Know, they're That's right. horrendous. And, and yet, it's interesting where if you say that you're a witch, um, Everyone will kind of go, oh, well, we you know, how can you do that? How can you say that? It's so negative. If you say yeah. you're a Dominican, everyone would say, oh, a religious man, how God, you know, yeah. it's crazy again. Which is not to say that there aren't very wonderful spiritual people within the church and real strands of a very creation centered oriented philosophy. That's what the Institute is about, is recovering exactly. that tradition from the church. Exactly. And um, you know, I don't want to see any art destroyed or, or no. thing, you know, beautiful things that have been created or letting people like, find their own way because, again, it's not a question of dogma but just allowing people to let, you know, magic, what you call like power within, rising from them and, and take them someplace. Um, I have to say that uh, one of my most favorite parts of your work, <laughs> well, actually you have, you said something that really reverberated with me that witchcraft, um, it's not about individual salvation, but it's about community. Mm -hmm. It's about, you know, interaction and struggle together. And, of course, ritual brings that together with you, too. But one of my favorite things is your section on gossip. <laughs> <laughs> because, for me, gossip is a major art form, uh -huh. you know, like when to speak, when to shut up, and, and um, that really it's such a force of community. And I, mean, I would be so hurt if my friends didn't talk about me, right. you know, if, 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 if I wasn't alive in their lives. And, and you, you said that, um, that gossip is really a bigger social force in tight-knit communities than law. Yeah, it's, well, actually, after I wrote that, somebody wrote, people always write me irate letters about what I've said that's not <laughs> politically correct. Oh, dear. You know, <laughs> somebody wrote me about how destructive gossip can be. And, and it is true that there's a certain kind of gossip, you know, that can be very destructive because you have no control over what people say about you, no way to answer it directly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in a real close-knit community, people learn to filter that out. Um, but what I'm talking about is more the way that you do talk about people. You know, you keep up with people. You want to find out what's going on with people. If something good or something bad happens, the word gets around. And it also means, in a way, that you then have a community that you're accountable to. That's right. You know, that um, if you go really out of line in some way, um, somewhere between calling in the police and hauling you off to jail, you know, and nobody saying anything about it, uh, there's a whole realm of more subtle sanctions where, you know, if you have a community of people you care about and you do something and they all come and sit down and say, that was really off, <laughs> yeah. which has happened to me, you know. You feel it. You care about it. Um, it changes you. You start to look at what you've done in a different way. And I think that's one of the things that we have lacked as a society, just that kind of 
organic fabric of collective care for people. Yes, that's a lovely way of putting it. Or <clears throat> for me, like this image of, you know, the women at the well talking or something, you know, that's, it's a hearth almost. Mm -hmm. You know, it is. It's a place to build community around. Um, one thing, too, you know, in, in looking at Western culture, um, and I found this interesting in your work and, and following what you do, is this, this idea, and it, it's always really sort of bugged me, is this myth of progress, mm -hmm. you know, that, that suddenly now, you know, we're in this new age, and now we're on the verge of understanding human potential, or now we can understand the brain, or now, uh, because of all the science and progress, or, or even like we have sort of popular Jungian psychology telling us that, um, you know, we've evolved to this point in this, mm -hmm. this slaughter and overthrow of earlier cultures that were, um, had a central goddess as, you know, the yeah. main figure that this was really necessary so the ego could grow or the, so that there was this differentiation of, um, and now, you know, we've made all this progress and growth. Whereas to me, you know, like human nature is human nature and we've been human. We made art 40,000 years ago and did mm -hmm. ritual then and we do it now. And uh, these civilizations were very advanced and created some of the most beautiful art ever, you know, and lived in peace, had, you know, was a fantastic civilization. So this idea of that, you know, we're really on the verge of something new here. Yeah, it's, I think it's one of the most strongly embedded concepts in Western culture. And it's, it's tremendously disrespectful, you know, not just of earlier cultures, but of people alive today who are mm -hmm. not Western, who live exactly. differently. It's really very racist in its core. Yeah. Yeah. that somehow or other tribal cultures don't have ego and they don't have the same kind of consciousness we do. Um, you know, Jung had a lot of incredible insights, yes. but you can't look to him for history any more than you can to Freud or to Marx or to Engels or any of them. If for no other reason than a lot of the materials we have today, they didn't have. Exactly. You know, most of the stuff that's come up about the goddess, the excavations, all of these things, those are all, you know, the last 20, 30, 40 years. They weren't available to Jung. So why should we look to him to define history or archetypes or any of those things for us? He was working on the material he had. He was working out of his own biases. You know, he did some very excellent work we can build on, but we have to criticize those biases. Too. Yes, I think so too. I mean, he, he did have the sense of containing a lot of things at the same time and complementary things and holding things and living with a simultaneity of, of, of forces in your life. And I, I learned a lot from that. But this, this other idea of, you know, balancing the male and female within or you have this animus or this, the structure of the psyche or um, Eleanor Gaiden in her new book has the thing about the hero's journey, you know, uh, you know that that's really emotion away from the feminine. And, and Maria said to me one time that it was, you know, that Campbell's work was just kind of coming, I mean, her work was coming into Campbell's influence at the end of his life, you know, so that could have opened up yeah. a lot for him because even in his interviews with Bill Moyer, I mean, he doesn't give the goddess any Paleolithic evidence, right. you know, yeah. and that, that kind of stuff. Or, um, in, in Maria's new book at the end, she talks about, you know, Eric Neumann and the great mother mm -hmm. and how he has, she says, you know, how he has these primordial parents that emerge and the father. And she says, in the archaeological record, there is no father. Right. You yeah. know, so what's, what's the story here? Yeah. It's also, we love that idea of progress because, you know, I think it's, it's maybe part of our nature to like to feel that things are justified. You uh, know, that if all these terrible things happen, there at least there should be a reason, you know. <laughs> At least we should get something out of it. Right. But I get, to me, one of the things that, that comes with really understanding all the aspects of the goddess, all the aspects of this living being that is the earth, is understanding that um, things, things have consequences, but they don't necessarily work out in any way we can figure out as fair. Um, maybe, yes. you know, maybe this is all the goddess's great experiment to keep herself amused and entertained, you know. Yeah. Um, but her idea of what's amusing is very different from like, mine or yours, perhaps. Yeah, I dare say. I mean, one tries to write it off as cosmic humor or yeah. imminent humor or something. Or maybe it's just 
the idea that there is randomness, there is yes. chance in the universe. See, that is really hard to live with. And, and I feel that way too, this chaos, you know, that uh -huh. there is this randomness because we want to impose this order because it's comforting. Right. But how much harder to live with the terror of that there isn't necessarily a meaning or that we may never know right. why some of these things are, why they happen. And that's a much harder thing to live with. And yet that is the essence of what I call the mystery. Exactly. You know, when you can embrace that, you can embrace life and a depth and an intensity that's much, much more powerful. Yes. Um, well, we just have like a minute left. Uh -huh. I'm getting the signal here. So, well, Star, what about the next 10 years in the, this minute we have left? I mean, what, what do, you th do you think the next spiral dance is going to be 10 years from now? I hope it's not going to be before that. It's too much work. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. It'll, I'm sure there'll be others before that. I did a, a divination in the introduction to the spiral dance, mm -hmm. pulled a tarot card to see what the next 10 years would be, and it came out the high priestess, mm -hmm. who is the moon goddess. So I think that we are coming into an era where the goddess is not only awakening, but awake, and going to be much more of a cultural force to be reckoned with. And I hope we're also coming into an era where we begin to awaken to the earth and the life of the earth because I think the next 10 years are absolutely crucial for making decisions that are going to determine the quality of biological life on Earth for the next thousand, hundreds of thousands of years. Starhawk, thank you for being my guest, and thank you for watching. Thank you. And good night. <laughs> Ay,